Hi, my name is Jim Revere. I'm a Burroughs Welcome Professor of Pharmacology at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. So, I was chair of an Institute of Medicine committee on looking at food and drug safety in developing countries. This report was commissioned by the Food and Drug Administration probably about 15 to 18 months ago. And the primary driver for that was a realization from FDA that imports coming into the United States in both food, drugs, and medical devices are increasing. And they needed to know essentially what the status of regulatory systems were in the developing world. So, so the, the reason that our committee looked into what's happening in developing countries is the enormity of the import issue for food and drugs. 80% of the active pharmaceutical ingredients in drugs marketed in the United States come from outside of the United States. 85% of the seafood we consume comes from outside the United States. There's been some estimates that import lines increase 13% per year. And when you actually look at what FDA's task is, there's been an estimate that they have to essentially monitor 300,000 factories around the world that produce products that end off in the U.S. And this comes into 20 million import lines that they are responsible for. So, so just think of that, 20 million import lines. That's not packages or products, but that's a specific line of a food, a drug, or a medical product that comes into the U.S. So, so the question often comes up is why can't we just restrict imports to very specific countries or regions of countries? And in reality, it, it, there's trade agreements in place, and in many cases some of these can, could be viewed as barriers to trade. What has to change is that countries have to develop an ability to both produce safe products and document that their products are safe. So over the, over the last 15, 20 years, there's been a number of issues with food and drug safety that, that have impacted the U.S. Currently, Avastin and counterfeit products have been in the news. A few years ago, heparin products that were not um, actually heparin were in the news. But before that, there was a massive issue with melamine contamination of pet food in the U.S. and Asia and actually um, infant formula in China that resulted in a significant number of fatalities and permanent renal disease. There's also been situations that's fascinating with ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol was the original reason that the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act was passed in the United States last century in the 1930s and 40s because of contamination and yet five or ten years ago ethylene glycol contaminated um, toothpaste and other products in Central America. So, so one, one of the the major reason that that this committee spent time visiting we visited South America and Brazil, China, South Africa India and had representatives from about a dozen countries either at those sites or back at meetings in Washington. We wanted to get a sense of what, are, what is the strength and weaknesses of regulatory agencies in developing countries. And in fact, the task of our report was to define what is a core element of a regulatory system and how can we establish guidelines where the U.S. could partner with other regulatory agencies. It turns out that there's a number of agencies that um, the WHO has referred to as mature regulatory agencies. These include the United States, Canada, the European Union, Japan, Australia, and a number of other European countries, for instance, Switzerland and Norway, that pretty much have equivalent inspection protocols and controls over their systems. So what we have been trying, and our strongest recommendation is, is that first of all, the U.S. FDA should partner with those regulatory agencies that it can trust. And what it should do is it should not duplicate inspections. If we know, for instance, in a developing country that both the U.S. and the European Union inspect the exact same factory, they do that 
by not inspecting something else that is not inspected at all. So what we want to do is really promote a sharing of inspection resources and a coordination for the mature regulatory agencies to be able to leverage their areas. The second thing is, is in those regulatory agencies that aren't developed, there's need and a significant need to improve the infrastructure, to improve communication and coordinating between the mature agencies and these other agencies to get them up to speed. So, so people have asked us what would be success in this report. Success in this report would be in 10 years from now, I could give you a list that's twice as long as to what the US FDA would consider would be a mature regulatory agency. So, so what, what do we think is gonna happen and, and what can we have FDA do to try to, to improve this situation? There's been a number of reports that have indicated the the weaknesses in the existing regulatory system. When we looked at it from the overall aspects of what FDA does, we have to realize that FDA is presently structured as an agency that was formed for domestic consumption of domestic goods. What has become obvious now, and especially in the last few years, is that that is no longer reality. FDA is hampered and constrained by an ability to actually apply resources to where the problems are. They need to adapt a risk-based system, and this is a risk-based system not just to look at what goods to actually inspect and handle, but how to allocate resources to where the problems are. So part of the discussion we had about partnering with regulatory agencies, if they can trust another agency, they can take both inspection resources, surveillance resources, training resources and apply those to other areas to try to strengthen those systems. So for example, if Congress and the Food Modernization Act has required them to have increased inspectors on the ground in, say, China, what we strongly realize is that the need to do is to get other mature regulatory agencies to also do some of the inspections in China, but look at some resources to provide training and an ability to increase surveillance networks for those situations in order to be able to control the safety of those products. So we're looking at, at an ability of, of getting FDA to partner with other agencies, to partner with non-governmental organizations to strengthen the regulatory and surveillance networks. Also to get FDA to work closer with private industry to establish their own attempts to increase the integrity of the supply chain. There's a program called RX360 that is aimed to improve supply chain control of pharmaceuticals. The National Cattlemen's Association has done a lot of work with beef safety type programs to essentially establish players and suppliers that they can trust and to work out ways that incentives are then given to, say, producers in a specific country to be able to import into this country if they can prove that their supply chains are safe. There is a Drug Safety Act coming before Congress this summer that also looks at improving the supply chain. One of our very specific recommendations is that the one up, one back um, inspection protocol, in other words, if you are supplying something to uh, industry in front of you that you know where it came from, so everybody knows who they dealt with before and after a sale that that now is going to be mandated for foods, that also should be mandated for drugs with the goal of having an end-to-end -end supply chain integrity.